Well, welcome everyone. I'm delighted to have you all here. Thank you for coming out in this terrible weather. Um, I really do appreciate it. We're going to look at the evolution of the dinner table today. And we can't talk about the dinner table without looking at the sideboard or the buffet or um, the dresser. But I'm going to call it a sideboard just for simplicity's sake. So the dinner table did not always look like this. Why was the sideboard so important? It was, uh, it was presented in the same room as the dining area. And its function in the early days in the Middle Ages was to keep all the um, silver that was very valuable at the time in a place that was considered safe. So it wasn't necessarily laid out on the table, but the more valuable pieces were always kept to one side, although they were used during the meals. The other reason was that the kitchens, of course, were quite far away from the dining areas, not like today. One, it would keep the smells away, but what that meant is that as the staff brought the dishes through, there had to be a space where the dishes could be prepared, the final touches done, the carving up of the meat, for example. Also, they liked to poison each other in those days, so someone had to taste and probably yeah, die quietly in the corner, very elegantly. Um, and then also there was a dual purpose um, in terms of bringing wine to the table. In those days, the cup wasn't um, on the table. It was brought to you by your cup bearer. So you, in the bigger houses, you'd have two of those, one specif specifically for your drinks and the other one for your, for your dining. What I've decided to do for this lecture is to work, <laughs> is to work with um, paintings and murals and drawings and to try and illustrate the evolution of, of this. So this is one of the sideboards, the first we're going to look at. It's in the Hall of Love and Psyche. And it's a detail of a fresco by Giulio Romano from the Palazzo del Tell in Mantua. And it's quite an extensive, huge fresco. It's really, well, I think quite beautiful. Um, but we're just going to look at this detail. We have in the middle here, we have all these plates, which were obviously um, quite important to eat from. You've got your pyramid over there, which would have used, um, been used as a salt cellar. So they came in different shapes and sizes in those days. In front, you have those wonderful urns and, and ewers. Um, and then to the back, you have these two lovely pieces. Probably all of this would have been silver gilt, not necessarily gold. And then the best part is in the corner, well, I think. <laughs> and this is, it's a, it's a drinking vessel in the form of a duck, which is quite unusual. And that's why I also chose to do work from paintings and murals is because they are a historical record of what could have, of what was around available in those times. So if we're looking at 16th century, of course, a lot of those pieces haven't survived to the present day. But that duck, for example, would have been based on 16th century German hanaps, which is what you see on the right here. Um, beautifully rendered different forms, really gave the silversmith an opportunity to showcase their talents and um, the detail and their capabilities. Um, up here we have a Spanish vessel. It's a pouring vessel, which is quite remarkable. I personally really love it. Um, I think the detail is incredible. And then down here, we have another um, hung up in the form of a, of a shell. We move on to the banqueting hall in Mary of Hungary's palace. Um, this shows three tiered tables. So you have tier one, tier two, and tier three. What's interesting here is that this is um, 1549, and in honor of King Philip II of Spain, a feast was held and that these tables are actually mechanized, so they could be lowered to the bottom and then brought back up. Interesting also because the French enjoyed it, so Louis XIV was quite partial to this, and it was a great showpiece and showstopper at Versailles. And of course, the effect of this is, is quite grand, or that's what they're trying to emulate, this grand effect. So you have this high tier happening, um, laid out with the silver beautifully. One would have been a table again for your drinks, and set within this, it's, a, it's an astronomy scene that they've painted on the ceilings. So you have this beautiful setting within these three tables, always having the linen right down to the floor, or the tablecloth. 
If we look to Italy, this is a rendering of a, another type of sideboard. As, as we went from the Middle Ages onwards, the sideboards expanded. And so they became larger and more glamorous, as it were, and more ostentatious. And the idea was not so much to have the pieces on the si side for safekeeping, but more to show off your wealth and how important you were. Obviously, the more ostentatious and beautiful, the more important you were as a, as a member of society. Um, there, also, or there is a theory that these were based on altar tables, and hence the elongated shape as well. And the number of tiers would represent where you stood in society. If we look at this design, it was for the pavilion erected in the park of the Palace of Versailles, 1668. So what's really fun about this is thinking that the table comes out of the home setting, as it were, or a dining setting, and gets taken into these, into these parks where pavilions are specially erected for um, feasts, for banquets, for entertaining. And what that did also was it brought a whole new dimension to the dining experience because the gardeners and the architects were also inspired by all this pomp and splendor. So before we move on to that, if we just look here, we've got the lovely terrine, this beautiful, big, impressive piece covered terrine, and then we have the ewers again with fawns as handles, which is quite fun. Um, and then in the center here, as we go up, we just have this grand um, assembling of silverware. Also important that remembering Louis XIV, Louis XV, you've got a lot of wars happening in those periods as they transcend over. They were quite fond of warfare. So a lot of the silver that they had would have been melted down and used to fund these wars. So a lot of what one sees in these um, drawings isn't available anymore today. And that's actually quite important for us from an historical point of view. So this is bringing what I mentioned, the garden architectural um, ideas and combining them with these banquets. So here in the middle, you've got this beautiful rendering, which would have, it actually forms, it, it works as a centerpiece. If you think in, in silver terms, you've got these beautiful centerpieces that adorn the table, dress the table up this would have had the same function. On the side here, though, is your sideboard. You can see it's elongated, it's grown, as it were. And we are firmly in the 17th century still. And with this being inspired, inspiring the garden and landscape, if we look to, especially to Versailles, the garden has created, for example, this waterfall sideboard. And it's, if you look at it, it really is a sideboard as a type of furniture, but it's been taken out of its context and placed in a garden and is still admired today as a water feature. Similarly, there is also a, um, there is a, what do they call it? The, uh, it's a banqueting space. And what they've done is they've tiered all the, it looks like an amphitheater and they've tiered it down. So you've got this running water and they have these garden feasts and parties within it. Similarly, also the fountain pyramid, it's the same idea, again, taking the sculptural and bringing it to life in an outside setting. And on this side, this is something you would see today in one of the English gardens, um, which is the mermaid, which has been modeled as a water feature. If we look here, we have the banquet held in honor of the Empress Maria Theresa of Austria in, um, in Vienna in 1740. The foreground is the public servants and the senior public servants all seated. And then if we look over here, you have your huge silver sideboard, and to the right is where your drinks would have been um, prepared and brought to the table. These are about 50 pieces that were there, so you can imagine <laughs> a sideboard with 50 ostentatious silver pieces is quite impactful, which is of course what the whole aim was. And the number of servants running around would have been quite enormous at those stages. And the last sideboard I'm going to show you is this one. It's my favorite, actually. The Great Silver Sideboard, which is a still life by um, Desportes uh, and from Paris Met Metropolitan Museum. What's lovely here is how the garden is brought into the sideboard through these garlands of flowers that run down. But if we look at the sideboard, on the center here, you have this wonderful um, fruit centerpiece, which is held upright by two fawns from their backs, 
which you can see at the bottom here. And what the creation of the fruit does was also to enliven the sideboard and also bring color, um, splendor. Of course, fruit was, um, and any, anything to eat was quite important. So you'd have fruit that was seasonal at that time. Here we have some figs, we've got some grapes and then other fruits in between. Then you've got these beautiful ewers with these sculptural handles again. In the middle here we have two Chinese bowls and then the center is the terrine with the chimera handles, which is quite beautiful actually, or I think quite beautiful. A lot of silver gilt and, gil and gold coming through as well and they would have used semi-precious stones as well to embellish um, the objects. So enough about the sideboard. <laughs> Let's look at the dinner table. So I'm going to take you backwards and then take you forward into the current or the 19th century. So here we have the family of Hans Rudolf Fesch, a table in 1559. This is a detail of the painting. And why it's important is it just gives us a qu quite a, a nice idea of what the table setting would have been like in those days. So Hans Rudolf Fesch himself was a wealthy merchant, which is quite important. So the setting that you see would have come from a fairly wealthy home or would have been prevalent then. And at that stage, they had only the knife. So each person had their own knife, which was quite a pointed utensil. And its sole function was, well, you could spear things up, you could try cut with them, and you could obviously eat with them. It did a multiple purpose functional tool. They didn't know about um, forks in those days yet over there. Um, so a lot of eating was done with the hands as well. If we look to the plates, we have trenches. So trenches were bigger pieces of probably oval wood that had a dugout in the middle and that was your plate. And that was obviously the forerunner of what we consider to be the plate today, just ours have shrunk slightly in size. And what they would have used those for is they would have uh, put a, a piece of bread in the middle, cut up their meat so that the juices would have sucked up into the bread as well and then started eating, which probably was quite a messy affair, but nonetheless. Here we have two, and there's another one here, two salts. Again, they would have had different shapes. Um, spices were quite important because the food was really bland. So probably you would have had your salt, your pepper or your nutmeg, um, sometimes also cloves. Being a merchant family, they would have obviously placed great importance on, on that. If we look here, we have it looks like a pouring can, and that was actually for mustard. Mustard in those days came in a liquid form, so it's nothing like we have today. So it would have been in a, in a utensil that would have been able to, to pour. And then the glasses, you have these open goblets, and then here you have the chalice. So the head of the family normally had, or often had, a um, more precious or ostentatious piece of, of drinking equipment, as it were, in this case the chalice which would have been derived from the church chalice in all probability from its form. In front here, you have the open seat. That's simply because this was a uh, Protestant family and in those days, they kept the seat open for the savior so that he could join them for supper at the table. Over here, we have this little piece that I'll show you later. So as I mentioned earlier, everyone had their own individual knife. Men in those days uh, walked around with their scabbards. Uh, daggers and scabbards and there would have been an extra compartment where you would have had your knife that you used for eating and thus everyone had it it, it was a very higgledy piggledy affair if you think today's dinners we like to make everything look the same and you know the same cutlery the same plates in those days it didn't quite work that way um, down here we have pewter so just just a reminder that we didn't only have the silver and the gold and the porcelain later on, but pewter played a really important part in those days as well, especially um, depending what family you came from. The ladies would have had these utensils where they would have had their eating utensils in, or they later on had a little, like a traveling case that they took with them wherever they went. Going one century ahead, 1643, we have the Bodmer family of Zurich. Um, what we see here is quite a large family as they would have been in those days. All the ladies to the right, all the gentlemen to the left and the little ease right in front. But what we see here is the, the knife now placed on the table for everyone. 
but the mother and father over here have got two sets. They've now actually got a fork, which was a two-prong, it looks like a rather blunt instrument. <laughs> it's two-pronged and they, there you go. It was very much a spearing up um, affair. But mother and father had that. In the center over here, you had spoons and those would have been for the children. So when the dinner started, they, the concept of having your own fork and spoon uh, and knife wasn't necessarily ingrained in th at that point in time. Um, so there the children would have all grabbed a, sp uh, a spoon and started um, dishing themselves and eating. It would have had a double, uh, double use, as it were. Then over here, we have a little salt cellar again, two of them. And this would have also been another um, uh, important implement in terms of either having the mustard or um, some other condiment in it. Here we have different types of uh, mustard holders. So this is the one where you pour, and then these take us back into what we would, well, recognize now 18th century, 19th century onwards. Then we have the banquet of the marriage of Maria Theresa and Franz Francis of Lorraine, Martin von Maetens. He was used quite a lot as a painter. She enjoyed having um, all of her banquets and events uh, painted. So this is in Stockholm. And why I've included this is because with these really big events for these important people, the emphasis was not on the table. The table, if you look at the painting, is actually quite quiet in many respects. Yes, you've got your silverware, um, you know, uh, you've got your terrines, you've got your soup spoon, which is in there as well. But it's quite quiet in terms of that first picture that I showed you with all the different heights to it. And the emphasis was on the purse, not on the table, not on what was going on around. It was literally so that people could enjoy or vis um, see what was going on during these banquets. Because, of course, a lot of these would also have been attended to by servants or, um, or the court, not servants necessarily, but the court who would have been watching them. In this print, this is a normal middle-class family having... Um, their dinner. They, they don't have a cup bearer, so therefore the cup is already present on the table. It hasn't been brought to them. And we also have all of these implements over here. The fact that they don't have a sideboard indicates that the family wasn't of a great standing. It, it didn't have that amount of wealth. So that would have been a combination of, of pewter, um, silver probably, and some um, other items that have been stored in that cupboard and used for the table and brought to the table, as it were. Wedding Feast of People of Rank, 1740. This is actually from the Netherlands. So here we have the sideboard, as it were, where the meat was being prepared or cut up or presented to the, bring ready to be presented to the table. And here we have our cup bearer, who's preparing the drinks and then presenting them at the table. And over here we have the knife, the two-pronged fork, as well as a spoon on the table for the first time. And then of course the display of wealth is in the um, display cabinet at the back. So quite important how things start are starting to surface on the table. But again, it's a very fairly quiet table, nothing too, nothing too exciting going on in terms of centerpieces and, and all of that. The reception of the Elector of Cologne in Venice. There's a lot going on here, of course. 100 people came to this, and the horseshoe was the formation used at the time, um, or for this particular event. And this event, what they used was, they used the French um, type of service, which meant that the dishes were already on the table when you came to the table as a diner but you weren't allowed to pass things around. So that made it a little bit tricky because <laughs> if you were sat down in front of something that you didn't like to eat, you couldn't exactly do much about it except for wait and wave and hope that the person on the other end of the table hadn't eaten what you wanted. So they abandoned that way of service and they turned to the Russian way of service, which meant that the diners were actually allowed to pass dishes around and to each other. And here you can just see over here you have the... Um, drinks being prepared, served, brought to the table, taken back again. And then at the back here would have been where the sideboard was. And quite the flurry of activity going on. 
This is at the Prince of Conti's townhouse. And why did I include this? Because we don't have any type of service happening, as it were. Um, this is probably at the end of the course, so it probably would have been dessert at this stage. And we have over here little tables. Um, there's another one on that side that have been brought to the table and left there. Those would have had huge um, wine coolers where you could obviously chill the wine, um, but also your glasses would have been put upside down inside to chill the glass. And then we have the uh, candelabras or um, candlesticks on the table, which had a dual function. One, it was to decorate the table, but two, remembering they didn't have electricity in those days. So the function was to light people up so you could actually see who you were talking to on the across from you, because otherwise that could have caused a bit of, bit of a problem. And then we have a plan for a table arrangement from 1770. These are actually quite rare. They, they don't exist a lot anymore um, because the idea was not to pr uh, produce them in order for them to be kept and stored away. They were created as, as the need arose for the particular type of function that was needed. So here, this, this centerpiece, as it were, you've got your three columns in the middle. And the center would have been decorated as a sculpted garden, which was the gardens as they were at the time. Um, what they used were uh, mirrored surfaces. And on those surfaces, they would use um, sometimes even sand, colored sand. And sometimes they used little um, uh, sweets that were nicely colored. Everything to beautify the table, make the presented as flowers or flower beds and um, of course throw and play around with the light as well. Then on here we have all the cutlery to the right, so fork and, um, the fork and the knife to the right, the spoon on top. That was the Spanish way of serving, so you had everything to the right. Later the Germans had the, uh, the knife to the right, the fork to the left, and that was the way the Germans had it. But here we have the Spanish setting, and at, of, of course it also shows the influences I mean, I'm speaking quite broadly as I do this presentation, but remembering Venice, for example, they had a fork way before everyone else. So all of these influences from these different countries came together, and as the courts decided, they preferred this way of doing things, so, so that was implemented, discarded, and, and so on. But quite a nice way of, of showing how something like this was planned out and the detail that went into it, and the amount of dishes that would have gone around in preparation for this. So each number, Unfortunately, a lot of the, um, the numbering has been lost as to what, what it was for, but you would imagine it was for certain, obviously for certain dishes and courses. And then at the ends here, you would have had your different um, spice, spices or salts or um, condiments, basically, or, or spices, yeah. And then if you look back, this is the type of garden. That's your setting on the right. So I don't know if you can see, but... I hope you can see the resemblance between the two. <laughs> um, and that's just a setting as it is in one of the French museums. And the, I just added this in for fun. This is just to give you an idea of what possibly could have been for dessert or for the mains. Um, yeah, quite, quite different to what we have today. We go to the banquet, which was given on the occasion of the marriage of Joseph II and Princess Isabella of Parma. Again, Martin von Maitens. And here we have, this is the royal couple, of course. This is probably the first course because of all the soup terrines. And the royal couple would have had um, gold, solid gold. The rest would have had silver gilt. Um, what I think is quite nice to mention at this stage is that these services were vast. I mean, they, could, they went up to 2,000, 2,500 pieces. Uh, that's a lot of pieces. Um, I think when we work in the office <laughs> and we try and store a small, well, a small set of 140 pieces, we go, oh my goodness, where to put it? But now if you think of 2,000 pieces, that's a whole different ball game. Um, and also what's interesting to note with these is Often today we find a piece that's been taken out of isolation from its service. So maybe one or two pieces have survived and they come down. And we look at it through probably a little bit of a critical lens in that we're looking for flaws and, and the, how the piece has been made. 
But when you think of the service and you put it back into context, which I think we often forget, um, they weren't made as individual masterpieces. They were made as a, pro you know, a mass production, as it were, for those times. So you can't be too critical when you look at them out of context versus a piece that was made as a once-off. But here we have them all around the table. This is um, the court that was there to watch. These, uh, the staff are there in the, in the Spanish livery, out of interest. And we have, so the table again, it's fairly quiet. You've got one little center piece over here, but the rest is all fairly flat and non-eventful, except for the gold, which would have, of course, if you think 2,000 pieces, that would have been quite an impact um, for anyone. So here we go, that's the entire painting. So it just gives you a frame of reference of how many people would have been at court and watching you eat. These are some of the, the dishes. These are, of course, um, later examples, um, but just to give you an idea of, of what would have been around. I couldn't resist putting in this to read. It was just too nice. So, yeah. This is the Grey Cup of King Charles III of Spain. I included this actually not so much as to look at the table, but to look at the setting. Um, because we often forget how uh, huge these houses were, are still, um, the amount of tapestries and wonderful objects that are in. So the table as itself within that setting, of course, just pulls everything together and gives you this real grand feeling. Also in those days, which I hadn't mentioned, is the tablecloth, of course, went right to the floor. And as you had a course, so the first tablecloth got removed and then the second course came out course got removed and so the next tablecloth came off. So it was almost like this peeling of an onion and your last tablecloth was then your pièce de résistance, the most beautiful one that you had, I suppose, for dinner. Here we have again uh, the Viennese court and what we have here is this runner, which is what you looked at on your plan, the plan that I originally showed you, the table plan. That would have been your runner, which was brought out at the last course. So you had this table runner that came out, and then it was prepared with your mirrored, um, mirrored stands on little feet, and your sands or your however they wanted to decorate it. And then here we have two rows of candlesticks on either side, for again one for light and one for effect. But it's when you start seeing this, we start getting the feeling of highs and lows within but you can still see the people, which is quite important. So here are the royal couple, and then over here is another uh, important guest, and why we know they're important is because you have the space between the next set of guests. So that would have been um, fairly important. And here a detail shot, just to give you a better idea. Here's your mirrored surfaces, and then you have your little figures. This is confectionery I showed you earlier. That would have also been brought in and displayed as well. And then here you have your little dishes in front, and then each person had their dish. And here you have the spoon, the fork, and the knife all placed to the right-hand side. And that's again just to give you some context as to the vastness of, of the whole affair. These are some of the mirrored stands that have survived. This was actually sold at, I think it was Christie's, for an exorbitant amount of money, it was 200 to 300,000 pounds, just to give you an idea. But um, beautiful workmanship, Paul Store, of course, a really important and good um, maker. <coughs> and just a detail to give you an idea, one in marble on, the, on your right, and the mirrored surfaces on the left, which would have been then embellished as well. So this was the feast held to um, celebrate the election of the King of the Romans. Here we have quite a, a stylized way of approaching it, I suppose. On the side, you have these huge sideboards, which are absolutely like dripping with silver and gold, and it's just over the top and ostentatious. On the sides here, you have the first rank electors. Each one has their little table, so there were, I think, eight in all together. And in the middle here, you've got the second rank. And then at the back, of course, you have the royal or the emperor at the back with, um, with the high important personages. 
So the second rank elector, which was in this one here, if we look at that detail, the first thing you'll notice is everything is silver. There's no gold. Whereas on the days, they would have all been made of gold and presenters as such, or, or silver gilt. And then here we have our little centerpiece with the fruit. And we have the German way of setting. It's the Viennese court. So you have the knife on the right, two forks on the left. One was used simply to hold your meat to cut. The other one was used to take, um, to take the piece of meat to the mouth. And of course, in the earlier days, when you only had one utensil, that could also be used as a toothpick. So <laughs> they decided that that was not very um, fashionable and then did away with that. Um, and then you have the serviet here shown. So they described it uh, from where I took it as a, in the form of a cabbage. But basically, you had this, the serviet presented in a, in a nice manner to accentuate um, what was going on on the table. And then here's the detail of one of the sideboards. And that's just the whole setting as a whole, just to give you an idea of what, what would have been around um, later on. And of course, I haven't spoken about ceramics at all, but we, you would have had uh, it's dinner services of um, various, uh, various important makers, such as Seb, for example. Um, here, this is just, I put that in for, for fun. It's the Chinese export service um, that we had on, on a sale a few years ago, and then taking it into the 20th century or 21st, 20th century with Versace. If we move into the early 19th century, we have the feast which was given on the stage of the Theatre in the Tuileries in Paris between Napoleon I and the Archduchess Marie Louise of Austria. Why is this important? I suppose it is, Napoleon brought this whole concept into being un, unwittingly, as it were. He, he wanted to impress the old royal families and the old houses of Europe. And so he decided to put on this really ostentatious, huge, wonderful display. And he was actually copying um, the wedding of uh, Marie Antoinette earlier on, which had taken place at the Royal Opera House in Versailles. So hence being on a stage. And of course, if you're on the stage, if you've, you'll know that the boxes, the opera boxes can be used for the, um, for the guests to, to look in or the court to look in on them. But he got it completely wrong. <laughs> and funnily enough though, the way he did it was then taken forward into the 19th century and copied, or later into the 19th century and copied by a lot of houses um, and wealthy people. So we have the, the royal couple here and then you've got all these little people standing on the, sitting on the sides, but you've got these huge, massive pieces of silver um, that are actually obstructing the viewer. So the idea has moved away from actually the table being quiet so that the court could actually observe what was going on. Now you've got all this height being added and it actually obstructs, first of all, the viewer looking in, but also people being able to engage with each other on, on the, um, at the table. In front here, you've got two extra little tables. Those have this shell-like construction, I suppose. That was a nef, um, which was used in earlier years, and that actually held the king's knife, fork, um, or the eating utensils, as well as all the spices. That was then replaced later with a cadena, which was more uh, a box shape. Napoleon used both, plus he gave his future wife one as well, which was an absolute no-no. So by combining the two, he actually, what he did is he showed um, the royal houses or the older royal houses. He didn't understand how these implements worked on a table and what their actual function was. And then in the middles here and here, you've got these huge candelabra with these massive figures holding them up, usual fantastical figures holding them up. And then you've got flowers that have been added. Let's just see, yeah, we've got a close up. So I don't know, I hope you can see that's the only downside of working with art sometimes in this context is it's a little bit hazy but here you've got these figures that have been brought in on those mirrored stands here you've got your flowers that have come on here's your your um, bigger candelabras and the royal couple in the middle what you can't see on here but what apparently was at the table were um, decanters and glass 
and of course that tradition of bringing glass to the table further enhanced the table um, in terms of its ostentatiousness. And that was what he was trying to copy. So that's Versailles, obviously today, the opera, but that's the kind of setting it would have been surrounded in. I talked a lot, well, not too much, but here are your eating implements. That's your two-pronged fork. Here's your uh, gold cutlery. These are some different types of salts, all the same use, but in different forms and, and sizes. And then we have this banquet uh, for the Emperor of Russia, the King of Prussia, and the Prince Regent of England in the Guildhall in London. And this, again, you've got the same day's approach, almost like you had for the, um, for the uh, Emperor of the Romans. You've got the raised days here. This is where um, the kings would have sat. And then in front here, you've got the rest all spread out. But what you do have, which I couldn't get a close-up of to show you, but I'll just have to tell you, is that the glass is now firmly at the table. And so they could, you could take your glass and ask for more to drink versus waiting for it to be brought to the table, um, as an example. And then in the middle here, you've got your wine cooler. And again, silver predominantly to the front, all gold at the back, different heights, and you can't really see too much what's going on up there. And of course, the people from the balconies looking down. So these are just, again, some of the implements, uh, the candelabra, Paul Store, this is in the Royal Collection, for example. Um, up here, you've got a decanter trolley, which was quite fun. So you put your decanters on and you could pass it down around the table. And then, yeah, just, so just a few examples. And then here, the banqueting hall for the annual Waterloo Banquet at Apsley House. The centerpiece over here is actually on the table. It was created especially for, um, to commemorate uh, the Battle of Waterloo. It was made by a Portuguese silversmith and is still kept in the collection today. And the inclusion of this, the, the importance is the inclusion of the floral decoration, which we haven't really seen up to that point. It hadn't really taken off. It hadn't really, the French very briefly tried to incorporate flowers and it didn't quite work. So it's only in the 19th century now that we start to see that inclusion. And if you look to tables today, that's where you find this whole inclusion of um, highs and lows on your table and these beautiful flower displays. So staying with flowers, I couldn't resist. Simon Lysett, I, I really adore him. Um, these are some of the creations he's created and he is um, the florist to the queen. And then if you look at this, I mean, this is very much not the same, but it, is, it does take you back to those table runners where they were creating um, those floral decorations in the middle. And just another one. This is the Hofberg Silberkammer in Vienna. So this is where all the uh, gold and silver is stored currently. Um, just one of the table displays that they put out um, at the museum. But you can imagine, I mean, that all that gold is quite, probably quite garish for us today, but at that time, very much sought after. <laughs> and then uh, Buckingham Palace, the state banquet being prepared. Yeah, who wouldn't want to be there? And then just the, uh, the table with some of the confectionaries around. And then to end off, I just thought I'd take you through some fun slides. Well, I don't know, but wedding food of the 15th century and how to make a pheasant or a rabbit. Got a pheasant pie, wedding menu of 1683. But again, I think it's quite an extensive list. And you can imagine some of these houses had up to 727 staff, one of, you know, and the Lord left something to every staff member. I think nowadays they're down to 40 or so. But I mean, it's, it's huge. It's a huge amount of money. And table seating was very important, as it is today. <laughs> but you really had to think about who sat next to who, especially if you wanted something particular. Um, but then also interesting how that filtered through down to downstairs and how downstairs was as regulated, I suppose, as upstairs. Um, 
sometimes even more so, I think. And then Charles Carter's complete cook for 17th City. And every, for all the three months, you wouldn't know exactly what, um, what was to be made. Housekeeping wasn't very important, of course, so the schedule for the housekeeper um, to our left and to our right. The pugs had a really nice time, I think. And then a hunt down at the bottom. But, I mean, there was a fair amount of uh, cleaning, washing, and all the rest, mending. And then just to end off is... Um, I just thought I'd put together some slides of what the houses look like. So these are various houses all in England, but just to, uh, just to remind us really of the long gallery, the bedrooms, the dining tables, the reception areas, libraries, kitchens. Um, the butler's room, the downstairs, the washing rooms. The outsides always, well, the bigger houses had a church, of course, and a mausoleum, and they stay. And that's all. So, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>